the next 45 minutes. We've got the remainder of the hour to uh, really uh, expose you to a set of projects that took place as part of uh, what Bloomberg calls its immersion uh, immersion uh, activity that they put together over the last uh, couple of years. I'm Justin Hendricks from NYC Media Lab. I'm executive director uh, of that lab. It's a consortium of universities and media companies, media and tech companies here in New York. We do a lot of work with Bloomberg. Uh, we were quite pleased to play a role uh, in helping to coordinate this immersion uh, uh, a program this year as well as last year, uh, and quite pleased to work with Bloomberg on a variety of other uh, areas as well, uh, touching data science and, and touching related fields. Um, we are going to move very, very quickly through six presentations uh, from uh, six different teams. They're each going to give you a sense of what they did in their projects, sort of combining um, their approach to data science with real world problems. And we're going to hope to see some, some parallels in the way that they approach those problems and the way that they applied you know, different techniques, different ways of thinking about applications of data science uh, to the, the sort of social uh, and other problems that they addressed. Um, and we just saw a, a bit of a sizzle reel, that's what we call it in the media industry, I think, um, about uh, our first project with Grand Central Partnership. Uh, and that leads me right to introducing uh, Yuan, who's going to tell you more about that project and uh, introduce you to um, his liaison at Grand Central. So Yuan, I'll hand it over to you to present and be our first to go. And if we'll start the countdown clock back there. Everybody see that? Somehow we've got to finish in 20 minutes all three of these presentations in Q&A, so we'll do our absolute best to keep on track. Mm -hmm. Over to you. All right. Thanks, Justin. Hi, my name is Yuan. I'm from NYU uh, Center for Open Science uh, and the Progress, short for CUSP, and also I'm a PhD candidate from, uh, in Urban Engineering and Informatics at the Tendon School of Engineering of New York uh, University. I would like to introduce uh, Rochelle uh, Petrikov and, uh, uh, from Grand Central, who's a vi Vice President of uh, Operation and um, Administration from Grand Central Partnerships. So I would like to give an over, um, overall introduction about the, the Grand Central Partnership, uh, short for GCP. And uh, they have been investing uh, approximately uh, $15 million in purchasing um, all the, 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 the assets on the street, including the street, uh, street as, uh, streetscapes uh, features, such as light pools, news boxes, and uh, uh, flower pots and trash cans. And they're also in charge of maintenance and uh, replace all these uh, uh, amenities on street uh, in this business, uh, in business improved district. And our key goals through data science, we've been thinking what we can do in three days uh, it's not just using data science of some problems, but also really trying to combine the data science, analytical insights, and the operational insights from the organization. And what, what we're thinking about is trying to establish um, a, a, a protocol for this regular analytical uh, approach to understand how we can better maintain and uh, 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 report the condition of all the assets on the street, trying to think about how we can use data science to create a scalable and a reproducible analytical uh, insights. So what we're gonna do in three days, three days are really short, so we planned uh, to think about the first day gonna be for scoping, with trying to think about what kind of problem and what's uh, the scope conceptually and also physically considering what territory we're dealing with uh, uh, in terms of spatial and temporal complexity. Uh, we started with data exploratory uh, to understand all this uh, reported data on the assets conditions, which we call dockets, and uh, think about how we can combine operational research with analytical insights from data science. Uh, and we also think about trying to identify key indicator what matters the most for, from the operational uh, perspective. And, the, and also, we, the, for the first day, we're trying to think about what's the limitation of current data? What's the perfect data we can get about and how to compare uh, what we have in, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the limitation, uh, such as the scale of the data uh, and the frequency of the data or the resolution of the data? So here is a screenshot of the example about the, the total number, accumulated number of the reported dockets on different intersections in the street uh, in, inside of uh, uh, Grand Central um, District. And we also think about uh, trying to visualize what kind of condition happened in different assets 
um, because we are dealing with actual tangible physical assets on the street to, to figure out if there's any peak seasons or if any uh, frequent uh, issues happen at a specific location. And second day is really uh, to validate what we learn from data and against what we learn on the street and talking to the staffs. Uh, and this is a very unique opportunity from data scientist perspective because we are normally dealing with data uh, in front of the computer. We don't really know who generated data and how they generate data. And this is really the way we can observe the operation for me uh, in the real world and real time context and talk to the data collectors on why, uh, how they collect the data and what they think about the data gonna help uh, their daily operation and also validate the quantitative results from the data processing and exploratory analysis on the street, on the specific location and the specific assets. And lastly, we're trying to address certain biases, potential biases in data, because we're dealing with a, a data generated by the, the, the applications. So we're really dealing with user-generated data. What, what's about the potential preference or bias uh, of these users? Where, uh, so here we can see this is a, a, a bar chart of the, all the dockets reported by the, the different staffs, colored by different staffs. So we can see how these um, different team members <laughs> engaging with this digital tool and reporting data differently by, um, uh, on a daily basis. And when we hold the, the same months uh, are the same, and then we can see Actually, these uh, staff things, they are reporting things different, uh, very differently in terms of volume of the condition. So they kind of pay attention to different assets or pay attention or have kind of a preference to certain uh, assets. And the last day is really about synthesizing uh, from both uh, data science and operation. Uh, first of all, we're trying to consolidate some key insights about what are the major uh, metrics you can measure or indicators you want to keep track of uh, on a daily basis, monthly basis uh, for the, the operation. And also uh, trying to identify analytical routine. Uh, what is a scalable and reproducible thing that staff or uh, for the organization can, can conduct on the monthly basis? Uh, and uh, also, thing we, we talked about, discussed about future data management. Um, so uh, luckily, uh, GCV is on the process of the, the version two of their application. So we, we have a lot of really valuable uh, discussion on what we're gonna do on this better version of the application later on, what kind of additional data you can uh, include it or report. <laughs> And uh, lastly, uh, the potential in data integration. So uh, we, we talk about big data a lot of time, but I think it's not just the length of data, data, the, also the width of the data, where you can integrate different data uh, into your uh, original data set. So here we can see all the business locations within the district. So this is where we can really combine the streets uh, condition, the access condition with the local business and to, to create more uh, business intelligence or social value uh, in the long term. So the key insights, just on a high level, we think of three uh, key insights. First of all, construct digital in inventory for better data reporting. And second is set up baseline measures for more responsive operation. Uh, the last one is uh, to identify spatial temporal uh, pattern for preventive operation and long-term planning uh, for the better investment. Our takeaway from immersion in short uh, three days, I think I learned a lot from the organization to also validate a lot of uh, data from data scientist perspective, combine the, uh, the really uh, daily experience of the actual operation. So first is to invest digital inventory as a really a foundation for data-driven operation and how you set up this framework matters uh, later on, like uh, how, what kind of digital or analytical insights you can gain from this, uh, this, uh, this practice. And uh, also to understand the users when analyzing the user-generated data. Uh, lastly, to also to validate analytical insights with actual uh, operation insights. This is where data scientists, we don't really, ha rarely have a chance to talk to the, the actual operators. And uh, lastly, I want to point out, since we are talking about uh, better data for better governance, uh, really, this is really, we want to be aware of the data limitation of the data in terms of social biases and also uh, the, the potential impact of data uh, generated to the, uh, to the organization and also to the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna leave New York and next go to uh, Paris. Uh, so, uh, who, who's starting? Me. Okay, great. So, uh, Jean, come on. We're gonna let you, uh, Jean Philippe. We're gonna let you start uh, and tell us what you got up to. Okay. Uh, so, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy uh, with this to present you uh, the the project we design uh, with uh, with Bloomberg Associates. Uh, it's a, um, a project of a dashboard, a KPI dashboard for the city. And uh, we are, I present uh, you uh, Izzy Rajay uh, from Open Data Soft, and you are the data scientist on the project. <laughs> and I'm Jean-Philippe Clément, uh, Chief Data Officer uh, for the city of Paris. So uh, rapidly, why uh, is a very important project for a city to, uh, to build uh, a KPI <coughs> dashboard? Uh, simply for to increase uh, all the transparency process uh, for inhabitants, for Parisians. And um, it's uh, important for, for uh, all the team of the, of the mayor to uh, uh, have a, a good uh, steer and a good uh, following of, the, of this uh, public policy. Um, and now it's a, a real uh, big uh, commitment uh, on the uh, data transparency uh, mayor roadmap. So it's a, a big goal for my, my roadmap. Um, how we, we, we treat uh, this, uh, this subject and this project with, uh, with Bloomberg Associate? Uh, it's very simple. Our current situation, because we are reporting in, in the city of Paris at this, at, at, at this moment, and we have a big document, an annual big document of uh, 300 pages with a lot of KPI, a lot of figures, and a very beautiful uh, document, like you can see. And with uh, a lot of uh, table and a lot of Excel and uh, a lot of uh, things uh, that always um, uh, update monthly. A uh, lot of work for any agency for to 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 uh, create this uh, this reporting and uh, and no uh, connection, no direct connection uh, with the IT system. And it's a real problem when you want to have a, a city dashboard, a real time city dashboard. So uh, we began uh, the project with the goal of uh, simply um, build um, um, a new, a new uh, a design for, for this dashboard, for this KPI, a simple one. In one page, we can see uh, 10, because we have a prototype, so 10 uh, KPI. And we can see on the first page uh, only uh, the red one and the green one. Of course, it's uh, uh, the, uh, simple indicators. And um, after the, uh, this first uh, vision of, of, of the KPI of, of the city, uh, we have to, um, to work uh, with, uh, ag with each agency uh, to, to build new KPIs and uh, new goals for, 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 the, for the city. Um, of course, it's important for this type of project, if you want uh, have to a long-term goal, uh, to work with a, a very good tool. Because if you just uh, make a prototype, uh, just after the project, uh, you can go to trash, uh, trash it. And uh, uh, so, uh, just to, to work with uh, an actual partner of the city, uh, Open Data Soft, and uh, to, to, to try to integrate all this uh, process and all this uh, project on the tool of, uh, of Open Data Soft, and Ise can present you after the, 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 the tool. And uh, the project is for, for us and for all the agencies engaged on, on, this, uh, on this project, uh, uh, the, uh, um, um, uh, meaning to, 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 to begin to construct and to build a new area uh, with data for the, for the city and for the, uh, all the agency. Uh, perhaps, Ise, you can present us uh, uh, some uh, details of KPI. Yes, the idea was uh, to have a, at a glance on the home page the 10 KPIs by five domains. Uh, we have a platform that allows city to share data and uh, also to create a dashboard uh, with a real-time update. So if we take, for example, the number three, the mayor's program set a six-year uh, goal for uh, creation of uh, 100,000 square meters of new spaces for startups. Uh, today, four years later, they develop more than uh, 77,000 new square meters. So the goal is achieved, displayed in green with a check mark. If we go, uh, if you click on the KPI, 
you can go deeper into the data and see uh, the value of the KPI today, but also the evolution from the same period uh, last year and uh, several visualizations. For example, for this one, the best thing to do was to display on the map to see where those new spaces are. The idea was also to be able to uh, join another data set with other data, like for example on this one, the employment rate. Uh, so if we look at another uh, KPI, the number two, the mayor's program uh, goal was to answer within a minute 85% of the goal to the city call center. Uh, in August 2017, with 87.5%, uh, the goal is achieved, so displayed in green with a check mark. And if we go deeper into the data, we can see that compared to the same period last year, it's an increase of 2%, so uh, it's a good news. And uh, the most important uh, graph is at the bottom of the page. Uh, we try to analyze data to understand why sometimes uh, the services don't reach the goal. And we discover it's each time uh, there is a great increase of the call that uh, they are not able to enter 85% uh, within a minute. I so, let you. Uh, it it's very important to have uh, the access of uh, one vision, and one, one view of, of the KPI and, and the details. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, we can click on the uh, data sets. So there are, there are data visualization, but you, have, uh, you can uh, have uh, the, all the data sets, the data uh, to, to, to make another analyze of, of this uh, KPI if you want. And uh, another thing that is very important for the, for the data dashboard is to uh, create dynamic data and real-time data. Uh, the city of Paris have a, a Fix My Street app, uh, and they produce a lot of data with this app, and they, they are uh, an important goal uh, for the services and the agency because uh, they have to, uh, to, to get a response uh, uh, in, uh, less, uh, within, within 10 days. Uh, so um, it's important to, uh, to manage this, uh, this KPI and to see uh, in the real time where is this, uh, this KPI for, the, for agency and for management too. And uh, uh, so with uh, Open Data Soft, we... <laughs> yes. Uh, we work to automate the data that uh, are feeding the dashboard and especially for this KPI, the number nine, regarding uh, the issues process within 10 days. We create a connector with an API directly to the IT system of the city to make the service have their, uh, their data. Uh, each hour, it's uh, updated. So for them, it's a way to be sure to know uh, where they are in uh, real time. But also, uh, we put them on a map to make them, uh, to help them uh, analyze the data and they find some uh, sociological reason for the major uh, cluster that you can see on the map. So uh, it's uh, automated and uh, to next uh, is to automate the other uh, the, uh, KPI, sorry. Yeah. And uh, it's very important because with, uh, with, this, uh, with this tool, uh, we can also uh, uh, have data visualization, but you are, uh, we can also calculate uh, the, 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 the KPI, and it's not uh, uh, too, too easy to, to, uh, to build. Uh, just to finish, please, uh, rapidly, uh, some, uh, some outcomes of, of this project. Um, of course, uh, it's uh, just the first step for this, this new dashboard, and uh, we want to, to work with uh, all the agency to expand all the, the KPI on the dashboard. Uh, we want to, to fix all KPI because uh, the, the, the project reveals that uh, all KPI are perhaps uh, uh, to redesign uh, and uh, to create a new KPI uh, with this project. We want, of course, to automate uh, uh, all the process uh, of uh, production of the, of the KPI, uh, like uh, Issa uh, uh, explained. Um, we want uh, to use this new connector with a multi uh, domain and multi project uh, uh, data, uh, data project. 
uh, it's it's a very uh, big uh, big thing for us to to work with this new connector for for all the uh, legacy the IT legacy of, of the city, and uh, uh, of course <laughs> we want to publish <laughs> this dashboard for Parisian. It's uh, the first goal, um, and uh, we want uh, to to rethink uh, all the process of of the reporting uh, with this project, and is a very important uh, uh, first step. Uh, and thanks a lot with, uh, with, uh, for, for Rose, uh, Jill Ern, and Alice uh, from uh, Bloomberg Associates for this project. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to come back across the ocean uh, to, to Bogota. And I think uh, <laughs> oh, we've got seven minutes. you've got a few minutes. We, we, we've, we've added some time on for you. And uh, I, I'm not giving it to Xavier. I'm giving it to Jaime. To Jaime. Jaime. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is the uh, presentation of Bogota Citizen Complaints Dashboard. This is a work we did with uh, Bloomberg Associates and the Veduria Distrital. The Veduria Distrital is something like, I will call, I will, I will call uh, the Veduria BD, so that means it's the ombudsman of the city. That's, that's my role in Bogota. And um, uh, Bogota is over 8 million um, population. Uh, this is the capital city of Colombia. We have more than 250,000 complaints for all these 76 public offices uh, by average every year. So what we, we're trying to do with this project is to make all of this information available for public officers to improve the decision making in the city. And uh, what's important is uh, we are one of the three oversight agencies in the city. But the most important thing is we are like a bridge between citizens and the administration. So it's very important for us this project because it's going to be a tool to improve that dialogue between citizens and the administration. Uh, while, while, the, while you're reading the objectives we have, uh, for us, it's really important to help to improve uh, public management in the city, but as well uh, to put data analytics in the public agenda of Bogota. So people should start talking about the data is important to improve the policy process. And uh, we are doing that by example, that this is the way we are telling other uh, public officials in Bogota that this is important. Uh, we're working in a large initiative of the BD, which is called like a strategic management of information, and this is part of the current city development plan. We got uh, those uh, 250,000 complaints in different channels. We have just like in the middle, just one data set, which is called SDQS, is the whole uh, information in just one platform, the, like the central recipient. And then we try to do with this dashboard to put this information available for the mayor of the city, local mayors, the directors and secretaries, and the 15 sectors in the city. And mainly, this is really important for the heads of the citizen services office in those 76 uh, public offices. This is the way we decide how, what we're going to do. We first, we decided to work in a period of 18 months, which means from the beginning of current Mayor Peñalosa period. Uh, on those 18 months, we have more than 370,000 complaints. Uh, within that, we decided to work just with the 40% that the, it is georeferenced. Then we decided three sectors, the three sectors with the highest volume of complaints, which are health, transportation, and education. And within those, we decided to work with two issues by each of them. So at the end, we, start, we, we did the work with tw over 23,000 complaints out of the 370. This is the prototype. And I would let uh, Javier to present the Thank prototype. You, I have a very short period of time. So I'm going to walk uh, through the dashboard in a second. But first, let me tell you that this is my second year in a row that I'm presenting here as a data scientist. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, last year we went, uh, we were presenting a really cool project with Benefits Data Trust, a really cool nonprofit organization. Matt Stevens, director of data science, is here. And uh, this is also uh, another great project that we did together with the Beduria team. Uh, Juan Felipe is the head of the Innovation Lab with Chef Perrin, which is over there, which is the other data scientist that uh, 
we put together this amazing dashboard that I'm going to show you very fast. Uh, I'm asking you that uh, you can uh, ask, uh, we can provide the link and you can explore in your cell phones, in your notebooks. That would be much better. That I'm going to I'm going to run through the presentation very very fast. But I encourage you to take a look of all the functionalities that the dashboard has because it's really something that we put a lot of effort and I, I really want you to, 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 look it, to look at it. Okay, just 30 seconds, the dashboard, um, the main section consists in two, two maps. One aggregates uh, complaints by zone, the other shows a particular uh, um, location in the map. You can filter at the top by, by sector, by period of time. There are some um, time series line plots to see the evolution of the number of complaints through time, totals by sector. When um, a health complaint is clicked, you can see the name of the hospital, the name of the college, when the school, when uh, education complaint is clicked, and the specific address for a transportation uh, complaint. Uh, you have a series of or bar plots that aggregate this through several dimensions. And uh, the way that we envision the use uh, of this dashboard is that the decision maker in the Veduria can navigate through the complaints to see, for instance, what happened in this neighborhood. There is one hospital that concentrates most of the complaints and the issues in that hospital are related to outpatients uh, appointment scheduling and medical record history. So this is how uh, this um, dashboard could be navigated to allow decision makers to take either corrective or preventive actions to deal with this issue and provide a better service for the citizens of Bogota. Just one minute. The uh, some um, long-term outcomes that we would like to highlight. We have a lot of work to do with the data in Bogota. We have a lot of data, but we have to make it uh, with more quality and available for the decision makers. Uh, we're going to improve the way uh, uh, services provide, are provided in the city. It's, it's going to be really good for the, for the decision makers because it's going to be closer to the citizen needs. And it is really important for the Veeduria. This project is related with uh, the create uh, strength and trust between citizens and the city administration. So that's it. Thank you very much. We, we unfortunately don't have a whole lot of time. I, we have really a time for just one question, which I'm going to put to all of you. And maybe each team will, will think about one person answering this. Um, but each of you have looked at applications of data science uh, in cities and improving the relationship between citizens and governments. You've learned something about uh, that, that application and doing this project. What's the biggest thing holding uh, our cities back from being more data driven, just based on your experience? Based on my experience, yes. based on my experience it's actually having the data, collecting the data and having the data. Okay, so it's data acquisition. Yeah. So for us at the Veduria, and especially at the lab, we think that if we analyze more data, especially public data, we can act in a preventive way, especially just to improve the lives of the citizens. And for example, uh, the complaints we just showed, Jaime just showed, is kind of a layer so public officials can improve the way they make public policy. So it's very important for us for that. Yeah. The, the literacy uh, said that we, we have a lot of data. City, we produce a lot of data, but I uh, uh, agree with you because uh, it's not uh, the, 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 the only thing. Uh, we have to connect this data, we have to, uh, to build API, you have to build a new, uh, new tool uh, for, for connection and for use uh, with data science. So uh, there is a very big uh, technical project uh, just behind the, the, the data. Well, I think you can tell from these presentations that we are going towards that future at least. So I want to thank this panel, uh, three cities, uh, th you know, uh, three different continents, and uh, three excellent presentations. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll uh, I believe, let you all go off this way so you can uh, hand back your microphones. Um, and uh, while we're basically changing cast members, we're going to invite um, a new group up onto the stage. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to ask them to come on now. So we've got uh, three teams um, who are going to join us from iMentor, Matriculate, and Bringing Hope Home. 
And I'm hoping that uh, our organizers are going to be a little bit uh, generous with us in terms of time since we are um, running a little over. Bob, yeah, I believe we're starting with you. Is that correct? Yep. We're, sorry. Here we go. <laughs> uh, excellent. So uh, we're going to start uh, with matriculate. And uh, you all will, uh, Madeline, you'll tell us what you're going to uh, present. Yes. Um, so matriculate is a national education nonprofit. Our mission is to empower high achieving, low income high school students to make the leap to our nation's top colleges. And we do that by recruiting, selecting, and training undergraduates at school to become virtual advisors, helping our high school students both gain the basic knowledge they need to navigate the process and get to know people who show them what it actually can look and feel like to be su successful at selective schools. In particular, we serve students who are likely to undermatch and who often live in communities without access to strong in-person college advising. And we do this in partnership with College Point, Bloomberg Philanthropy's initiative focused on virtual advising for high achieving low income students. We're almost on year three of this effort and we've grown rapidly. Last year serving 500 students, this year 1,000 students. Initially working um, using Salesforce as our central tool for our high school students and our college student information and for our college students to be logging their daily, weekly, or monthly interactions. But Salesforce didn't meet the user interface expectations of our college students, so we pivoted to Airtable, which while successful from a user interface perspective, doesn't offer the kind of data visualization tools we need to manage this kind of scale and to quickly view the data we look at on a weekly, monthly, and, and more often um, process. So that was a challenge we shared with Bavia. We need dashboards to see the data points that matter most to us on a regular basis. And um, in an incredibly short period of time, he somehow managed to achieve that goal. I'll let him talk a little bit about that. Thank you so much, Madeline. OK, so, so I was given the task of either suggesting a built-in tool like Power BI or something, or making a new tool which satisfy our requirements. So our requirements were that we need to use Airtable as our data source. We need to have real-time updates. And we need to be cost-effective. So for those of you who don't know Airtable, it is just an online storage service which can be considered as a hybrid of spreadsheets and databases. It, is an, it provides a very good user interface and a lot of features. But like everything else, it comes at a cost. So there are a lot of constraints in the API while fetching the data from Airtable. Like we can only make five API calls per second. In each API call, we can just have 100 records. We cannot just get the updated records and stuff like that. So in the in initial days, I tried to explore different, different tools to figure out if something can match, I can use it directly or not. So I explored Power BI, I explored Dasheru, I explored Clipfolio, everything else. But the thing was, each and every one of them has some or the other kinds of limitations. So in the end, I decided to write, write my own new dashboard, which I did. <laughs> so uh, I use uh, Google Charts. Google Charts is just an online uh, visualization tool, which is completely free, simple to use, and very powerful. So what I did was, I uh, coded my application in JavaScript such that all these API constraints are met. And we can also get a data visualization using Google Charts. So uh, for the dashboard, uh, these are all the different features that I have in my dashboard. Like Because um, my dashboard uses Google Charts, it's completely free. And it, is, it supports different, all different browsers, major browsers like um, Edge or Firefox or everything. So it is platform independent. I have used only open source technology, so it does not require any single penny to build or use this dashboard for a long period of time. Uh, plug and play, so you can just, uh, just like a website, you can just open the application and it will show you the real time update from that point in time. So you don't need to install any particular software on the system to first get that and then uh, open the dashboard. It's just for everyone, anyone can of you can just open it up and see the current state of the system. And lastly, like it also has real time updates because every time you open the dashboard, it fetches the data set from the Airtable API using the code I wrote and shows on the using Google Charts. And of course, it's cost effective because it only consists of open source technology, so it is 
free, apart from development cost, sure. OK, so this is just a small clip which I showed from a dashboard. It has actually many more charts, and it is a different thing. But for now, we have just showed two different um, um, charts over here. And we actually have like different tables in our Airtable base. So for each table, we had a different section in our dashboard, which shows the current status of those particular things. As Matriculate is like growing further, so I hope this particular dashboard might help them track their current status and help them in decision making uh, in the future to come. So lastly, uh, lessons learned. So first, I, I think that no free lunch, right? So <laughs> if you want to have good features, everything, but you need to pay a cost. Like we saw in Airtable case, that it has good GUI, good interface. But I need to, like, there are a lot of API constraints, so we need to figure that those, those out. And data science and visualization, I think, is playing a very significant role in, like, even for nonprofits or smaller organizations. So I think we need a lot of people with data science skills to cater to those requirements. Thank you. OK, yeah. so next off, we're going to go uh, to iMentor. So uh, I believe, uh, uh, Leah, you're going to start. Uh, Eugene, Michael, tell us about what you did uh, for iMentor. Great, thanks. Um, my name's Leah. I'm a research analyst uh, at iMentor. And iMentor is a one-to-one -one mentoring for college success program. So we pair college-educated mentors with high school students in New York City, um, the Bay Area, and Chicago. And um, we kind of have two main components of our program. It's emailing or communicating on our proprietary platform once a week, and then having a monthly in-person meeting at the student's school. We hope our matches to last about like three to four years throughout the student's high school career um, to basically help them navigate the college process and enroll and persist in college. Um, and we have, we just, we collect so much data about our students and mentors. Um, we, we survey them three times a year. We um, collect participation and engagement in, uh, data on our proprietary platform, so how frequently they're communicating, what they're saying. Um, and we also get data from the National Student Clearinghouse about their um, college enrollment and persistent patterns. So um, we, we just we have so much data, and we have a research and evaluation team. Um, and, but most of our time is spent just helping to make sure we can collect this data and support our program staff who are doing the direct service. And so although we have so much information, one of the biggest challenges we're facing is just like we can't even dig into um, into all the, the stuff that we want to dig into and do the fun analyses. Um, we actually have about like 2 million data points for each student over the course of their time in our program, depending on how long they're there. So uh, we have a lot to dig into, and we tend to spend more time with the students. Um, and so we kind of wanted to focus on the mentors for our data fellows. And these photos are not like posed or at all. Um, <laughs> this is like really what happened. So um, well, before, before Michael and Eugene came, I just tried to collect as much of the mentor side of data. So we have like their application demographic information, all of their surveys as well. But just the same sort of stuff we have for our students, we have for our mentors. We just haven't had the capacity to dig into that information. Um, and so we kind of wanted to see if we could find any sort of interesting like patterns or profiles of what uh, like a successful mentor might look like in our program. So I'm going to turn it over to them so they can talk about what they did. Thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, so we had just three days, and we tried like first to understand what can we do. And we looked at the data, and the data is magnificent. It's actually, we really appreciate the efforts that the uh, iMentor team has done. It's uh, really great. It has so many data points. It has like the interaction. It has the statistics of the like uh, interaction between mentor and mentee. It has uh, all the service. So I think it's actually the, like, the service is uh, the, the most uh, useful part of the data that we looked at, because it has the service all over all the mentors that participated over many years. And, uh, uh, Additionally, we had the statistics on conversations, which is like how many times the the mentor and mentee communicated over over the like over the period of the mentorship. And uh, I think the Leah and the team they, they figured out that if the, uh, the 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 mentor and mentee communicate like more than 65% uh, of time, it's actually like 65% uh, like above average, then it's like very successful. 
also we had some challenges with the data because it's a, a really big amount of data and it's, uh, it was separated, separated between uh, different databases. It was pretty challenging to actually uh, connect all the data points and find out the whole uh, mentor profile. And uh, that's what we spent uh, like most of our time to, to get uh, the profile for the, to, for the data to input. And uh, another uh, problem that uh, we faced, and we actually uh, we faced on, uh, we focused only on the mentor uh, information because the mentee's uh, uh, information, because it's a high school student, they're actually protected by the law, so we couldn't uh, use the, any information about that. So we primarily focused on, on the mentor and on the statistics, and uh, so we tried uh, to help uh, uh, with like augment the decision-making process for the program managers who decide and evaluate the, the mentors. And what we've done, we were thinking about uh, trying the different machine learning models and feeding the data about the mentors and their service and their demographic data uh, and uh, their about, about info and bio uh, to, to get some uh, useful predictions of what would the program manager evaluation would look like. And it actually was a very interesting experience because we 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 did a came up, because we had limited amount of time we didn't have time we didn't have uh, time to actually try many models we tried the very simple models and we uh, we saw that we could increase a little bit uh, with the like the baseline models about like 15 percent but the there is a like a very um, it's a good opportunity to improve there because we can improve the the model itself. But as well, we can improve the quality of data, and that is actually like a very good action point for like us both uh, uh, to work on. Because the, uh, if you can make more connections and make create a better mentor profile, you actually can get a better prediction. And uh, as well, uh, Michael focused uh, on the analysis uh, of the Minty success, and uh, actually initially found that uh, the the amount of mentors which were considered uh, that it really matters, it actually didn't matter. And uh, it was actually a very interesting uh, finding. And uh, another one was the, the frequency of email, email conversation. It actually matters for the mentor and mentee. And uh, so the, to sum up, it's actually like uh, the very interesting part is how to improve the uh, gathering of data and uh, how can you get better data and uh, improve the model and try actually to, to build a recommendation system for the mentor and mentee to, pre to predict a matching score and build it on top of uh, all the data that we have. And uh, the, the most important uh, that I wanted to mention is actually to provide the transparency and fairness for the given predictions and the evaluations because it's actually re it really matters for the like, data that we use and uh, like, to prevent biases in the data. And uh, uh, I know I have. I wanted to give a few seconds to Michael. Okay, to sum 20 up. seconds. <laughs> uh, two higher level points. I think in, in this project it's very evident there are two features of data science. One is trying to explain things, and the other is trying to predict things. And sometimes you can predict, for example, mentor performance, but you don't really understand what constitutes a good mentor. And sometimes you can explain what is the success of a mentee, but you cannot predict who is going to actually apply to college in the future. And the second one is for that for good immersion day. It was wonderful. I think only ex exploration for one day, two days, or three days can lead to interesting results, both for the participating organization and for us, because you're outside your comfort zone. And we're also planning to collaborate more in the future because of that. So thank you. Excellent. Please. <laughs> Round of applause. Okay, so uh, bringing us home is bringing hope home. Uh, Vincent and Paul are going to tell us about uh, their project. My name is Paul Eisenberg, and I'm the uh, co-founder of Bringing Hope Home. What we do is we pay bills for families with cancer. We're a nonprofit. We've been around for nine years. And if you get diagnosed with cancer, even with health care benefits, your out-of-pocket can be up to $35,000. I experienced this when I went through a six-and-a-half-year battle with my late wife, Nicole, had a great job, had great everything, was still struggling. We just didn't think that was right, so we started an organization. We pay bills for rent, mortgage, utility, car payment, food, whatever that family needs. We help them in any way we can. We treat them like family. We've helped over 4,200 families local in Philadelphia and the surrounding area. We're coming up to New York, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh. And we had a great experience with Vincent, and I'll let him start it off. All right, thanks. So uh, I'm going to talk about two 
problems and opportunities where the data had some meaningful insight. And then two other problems that we don't have time to talk about that we looked into. So the first one is, uh, you know, there's a lot of demand out there. There's a lot of families that are experiencing cancer right now, even just in a small Philadelphia area. So over the years, Paul and his team have instituted like a first come, first serve process where at the first of the month, the application gets opened, a bunch of people try to submit their applications, and then once you hit 30 or 35, it closes. And the real, my sort of big grievance from that, about that from an outside perspective is that you have no idea how many people are trying to submit. So we're missing that crucial amount. It could be two people a month, it could be 100 a month. So I'll talk about that a bit later um, and how that drives into how much money we can give out to each family each month. The second big thing we'll, we'll contact, uh, talk about is that trying to identify top nominators. So families that are going through cancer right now are actually nominated to bring hope home by a member of their medical team. Predominantly social workers because they see a lot um, of the interactions with the family. Um, and because we want to partner with those people, we want to know, we want to sort of award the consistent uh, nominators. Now, the other two things that I looked into were um, there was a lot of complaints that the wait time was too long. So once you would submit an application, it'd be six to eight weeks before you're actually paid. And so for these families that are experiencing uh, a lot more of a financial burden than normal, that can be a long time when you know, you're on the on the borderline having your power shut off or whatever. And we, we don't pay the family, we get the bills from the family and pay the bills directly. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about is that there's sort of three big systems, no elegant way to communicate. Um, so we talked about that a lot. Okay, so the data that we use is Salesforce, so the applications are fed into Salesforce and you can just get it from there. Um, Salesforce is a great utility to just download all the data into like CSV format, great, props to them. Um, I looked at three main tables, so there's applications, about three and a half thousand. <coughs> applications over the last seven years, 550 medical team referees, and about 120 different institutions or hospitals. So the big uh, sort of time sink for me was the data is very dirty, as it always is. Stuff like a user entered, entered fields, so if you have a typo in your name, your address, your email address, that actually comes up as a second uh, record. And because I was trying to look at uh, specific social workers, for example, I needed to link up those those records. And then stuff like uh, once they migrated to Salesforce in 2014, so all of the data, the data before 2014 was just uploaded and we're missing a lot of the richness of the data that Salesforce provides. Okay, so coming back to this first analytic, which is projecting demand. So this is really getting to the fact that we don't know how many people are in need each month. We know how much money we have right now, so how much can we give to each family. And so this is a figure of the uh, monetary amount of the uh, grants given out over the last seven years. And so you can see these huge undulations. And there's lots of complicated reasons for why some of those occur. But in the last couple of years, you can see that we were at 1,500 for about a year, and made a step up to 2,000. And so there's been a lot of discussions, Paul and his staff and his board, about what's a meaningful, impactful amount that you can give and balancing that with helping as many families as you can each month. So data can definitely play a role in this. So like I said before, we don't know how many people are trying to apply. But what we do has, have is a surrogate of that. So there's the application is actually a two-step process. You first register, super simple, 30 seconds. And then there's a much more detailed uh, application process where you have to submit bills and whatever. It's a lot more time consuming. So we can use that first registration of intent as a sort of surrogate for the demand. So the figure here on the left um, is actually the top bar is the number of registrations, applications that are started, and the bottom bar is how many that are funded, and this is quarters over the last couple of years. So barring the first graph, I mean first quarter, it's actually not that big of a gap. So over, uh, 2016 is about 30 um, um, a quarter that aren't funded but that are started and it's actually not too high so after some conversations that we had while I was there um, the social workers saying that they would actually like to help more families and they think 
a thousand even would be still impactful. So if we took all the money in 2016 that Bring Hope Home handed out, spread that evenly over all of the uh, pre-applications that were started, you get $1,200. So here's, here's a good case where you know, super simple retrospective data analytics can give a nice objective monetary amount that Paul can take to his board and say, we're going to move forward with this, things will change, we'll keep an eye on it, we'll see how it goes forward. Um, and this was actually implemented in September's application cycle. Uh, about 40 applications were received, which actually wasn't anywhere near as high as we, as we were all beating. We had some sweepstakes, uh, and we could, we could actually fund all of them. So this is a really great step moving forward. Um, I've got no time, but this is the second analytic, which was this kind of a more of a personal exploratory thing, which is trying to identify those nominators, social workers, that are really performant. They get that they get one or two applications in every month consistently, regardless of what's going on. And because we want to partner with them, we know who they are. So I had a couple of questions I'm going to try to address. So uh, on the x-axis of both of these graphs is the total number of successful applications. So there's been some social workers that have had more than 20 applications funded, and uh, the left figure is the y-axis is the median time between starting and actually getting uh, the application in and approved. So even the best social workers, the ones in the red oval, still take between 50 and 100 days to get their application together. Um, and on the right figure is actually the average amount, average number of uh, grants awarded per month that they're active. So as you can expect, as you go to the very, very far right, the very, very performant social workers get pretty much perfectly two applications every single month. So they are right there. As soon as it becomes 8 a.m., they hit the button and they're done. So next steps that I've recommended to the Bring Hope Home team is that to uh, bring together those three different data sources, something like Tableau would be really great. Um, and if it's interactive, you can see who they are. Um, do you want to talk about outcomes? Yeah. So we, we reduced the amount, and we actually have dropped our wait time for families from six to eight weeks to about three to four weeks. Uh, it was much cleaner. We listened to our social workers. And as a nonprofit, we have like four levels of customers, social workers, uh, donors, but most importantly, the families. We were able to drop the amount of money, which $1,200 doesn't sound like a lot, but you would be shocked at how far that goes. I have four kids in college. $1,200 is a lot of money to me. But um, we were able to uh, increase our family help and our delivery much, much faster, which was tremendous for us. Thank you. I'm told by our organizers, unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A in this session. I believe all of you will be here a little later to answer questions in the, uh, from the audience. And in fact, people have them. Um, I just want to thank again Bloomberg for doing this. Uh, Gideon, Amanda, Sean, uh, everybody in here who's involved in this, thank you so much. So a round of applause to you.